And with that, Glenn, please take it away. Super. Thank you, Matt. So you've uh, heard a very nice introduction, so I'm not going to spend more time on my bio. You'll be able to read that and everything else that we're sharing in today's deck afterwards. So don't feel like you've got to copy anything down. You'll get everything we're going to show. Uh, first thing I want to explain is a pretty simple tip that uh, is one of the 12 I use every day. And this is about how to get your LinkedIn connection count up. But not just with anybody, but people who are actually relevant to what you do, which is going to lead to a meaningful increase in your overall LinkedIn network. And that is when you're about to close a rec. You've got a lot of candidates probably sitting in there that you never touched. Maybe all they got was an automated communication from your ATS system. So what happens to these people? Well, Stacy Zapar, who you may know is one of the most connected people on LinkedIn, uh, she shared a very good tip a while back, which is that she sends out a welcome message to each of those people before she closes the rec that thanks them for applying and sends them some links to some resources that she has and would be happy to recommend uh, you even for jobs at another company, which I thought was a very generous way to approach people, comes across as very genuine. And the uh, number of LinkedIn connections that she gets from that is significant, and I find it does work quite well. So tip number two, Excel works very well with everything. And one way that I think is very interesting that most people don't take advantage of it is with LinkedIn in terms of your search results. Because LinkedIn search, of course, is not very user friendly in terms of a call list or a contact list. It doesn't export to the format that you'd like. So what you're going to get uh, as part of uh, today's deck is a link to download the template that I'm going to show you, which is a really nice way to be able to get formatted results for whatever your LinkedIn query is. So let's say that um, you run a search, and it could be for pretty much anything that you might need. I'll do something fairly straightforward here. And of course, you'd probably be using advanced search so you can have more fields and um, other specifics. But when your search results come up, The important part, and I would say it's probably better, actually now I think about it, to do it in advanced search because you'll be able to narrow it down and put in a whole bunch of other criteria, is the um, all these results that pop up in here are not really formatted in a very friendly way. So what I like to do is just grab the data from each page. And this works. Um, on subsequent pages too. You don't have to just do page one. So let's say I was grabbing people from page one, page two. Here, I'll take page two here. Oops. Sorry. It's a little easier, I think, when you're doing this kind of highlighting of results to grab from the bottom and go up. So we'll grab down and go up. And then just right mouse click, copy. And then this template that you're going to receive, all you have to do is paste the data on the right tab, and we have several tabs in this file. This is going to be going in what's called the LinkedIn search results. And you want to make sure to use paste special, which is the plain text only format. Sometimes it's called values only. And when you paste your data in this, and as I said, you can have as many pages as you want, just make sure that when you paste in the next uh, group of results that you skip one row from the bottom of the previous one. So I'd be pasting here in A88 for my second group. But what's going to happen is that's going to automatically get reformatted when I click on this next tab. So this has a whole bunch of formulas populated. And you'll see what it did was it pulled the first name out, the last name out, the job title, the company. Um, if it had it uh, formatted right, the location, sometimes that doesn't always work. but What's nice about this, and again, the more pages you put in, the longer this list would be. Is that now I can copy this set of data, and I'll create a new spreadsheet that's going to now be my call list. And I'll do a paste special here. 
of just values because I don't want the formulas that are associated. So you see I have a nicely formatted list here of that information and you can add additional columns obviously for email, phone, and, and so on. Uh, I've got another version of this that also works with your connections, which is, I think, very useful too. So if you're um, on your LinkedIn connections page, go back up to that, and you can get to that, by the way, when you go under connections, just click that in your menu. You have a whole bunch of search results here that are effectively your first degree contacts, but maybe you're trying to recruit in a particular metro and you want to reach out to people that are only in that location. So you can select just people who have a particular location. And when you do that, uh, I recommend that you type in the full metro name the way LinkedIn refers to it. So most of those usually begin greater whatever the city name is area, like greater San Diego area, greater Seattle, as you see here. So type it that way. If you only type the city name, I find you don't get as many results for that kind of search. So here's a whole bunch of people that pop up. Again, you can just highlight the data. Keep holding your mouse down because you probably have more than 10 who meet your criteria. And this will keep expanding until you get to the bottom of where you want to go. So we'll assume that that's about right. Just for sample purposes, I'll take that. This is going to go on a different tab that I have in here. It's called the Connections by Location Data tab. And again, do a paste special for just text. And when you do that, that is going to automatically convert on its next tab here, the formula version. And you can see how it parses the fields out, which again, I can just copy and paste into a separate Excel file that becomes the nice basis for a call list. So if you don't like the way formatting works here on LinkedIn, don't worry. Excel allows you to balance that out when you've got the right formulas built in, which I'm giving you. All right, let's take a look at another method. And there is a link you'll see when you get to slide seven of the uh, slide deck. Uh, that'll let you go right to the page where you can download the template I was just showing you. So let's talk for a second about Facebook. Uh, I find it works very well in two ways. And I think I'm going to show this in a slightly different order. I put emails as number three, but I'm going to make finding people number three. And then we'll talk about emails. So you may be aware that Facebook added something about a year or two ago called Graph Search, which allows you to find people using natural language kind of phrasing, where you can actually say things like, people who have worked at some company name, uh, which it means they currently or previously worked at that company. If you say people who work at present tense, then it will only find people who currently work there. And again, this depends on the person populating their Facebook profile with that information, which of course not everybody does. That's probably one of the main reasons Facebook has not overtaken LinkedIn in terms of professional candidate search, but it is increasingly being populated, which makes these results ever better each time I try these kinds of searches. It is showing you, I find, just your first and second degree, or what Facebook calls your friends and your friends of friends. So building up your network on Facebook has value for this kind of search. So if I were to type that kind of uh, query on Facebook, and that's here, there's people who have worked for proficient and live in Texas. It normally defaults to this tab called Posts, which doesn't show the people. So make sure to click on the People tab. That's where you're going to see all the people names. And that's a nice uh, way to pull up people at a particular competitor or other kind of target firm in a particular location, which, of course, we know most people uh, can't afford to reload candidates for their role, so being able to do a combination search of company and location can be very effective. Uh, you can take it even a step further by adding job title families, because you don't necessarily want everyone who works at a company. I only want to find, for example, software developers who work at a particular company and live in whatever location. So here's a search to find software developers who work at the company, so this would be current employees, and again, live in 
whatever location. It doesn't have to be a state. You can put in um, province, foreign country, city name. Uh, I find um, the best thing if you're not relocating people is you can use live near. This is another way to do it, and then put in a city name. So if you want to do live near, say, Chicago, that will get you the uh, city and its suburbs. And again, make sure to click on the People tab so because it does not default to that in the results. So there's a really nice targeted list. I wish I could tell you that this works for every job title family, but it does not. So you'll have to test it out. If you get no results, it means, obviously, it's not supported in that kind of search. However, it is possible to get pretty much any job title you want. It's a little beyond the scope of what I can explain today, but I've got a link to a really good blog post by a gentleman named Blas, uh, who has researched this in some depth. And if you follow the steps he's talking about, you should be able to do it for uh, many more combinations. Now let me show you how we'll take this to another step, which is contact information. So you're finding all these good people. Now you'd like to find a way to reach them. Finding work contact information is not that hard, because uh, all you really need is the company's main phone, and uh, which you can get from their website, and usually ask for the person by name. Email addresses are also typically a standard format, you know, first name, dot last name, or something. But you would prefer to reach out to people at personal contact info. So what I like to use is the um, profile ID, which means that part of the web address that follows Facebook.com. So when you're viewing somebody's page, then take a look at that part of the username that follows. So Facebook.com slash, and then there's some username. So for me, it's Facebook.com slash Glenn.Guttmacher. Well, what that means is you can type Glenn.Guttmacher at Facebook.com, and that will automatically forward to my preferred email address. This also works, by the way, even if you get to a profile page that has one of these weird numerical ID addresses. Just take the value that follows ID equals and put at Facebook.com after it, and it will forward. I have heard some people find this does not work all the time, and it seems that it is probably due to people changing their settings, uh, which you can control, um, but most people don't do that or aren't aware of it, so this auto-forwarding works most of the time. All right, let's talk about searches. So you're a little bit spoiled, frankly, when you're on a job board or even on LinkedIn where they allow you to save a search and then it will notify you when any new results come in that match your search criteria. Well, that's great to have resume search agents and LinkedIn profile agents running for you, but could we do the same thing with search engines? And there are a few tools that have arisen for Google. Google used to have its own, actually, called Google Alerts, which is not uh, doesn't seem to be consistently supported anymore. But Bing does a good job with it. Uh, it uses uh, a very simple method, where if you run any search query on Bing, all you have to do at the end of the web address is add the ampersand, the and sign, format equals RSS for RSS feed. There is no spaces in that. So let me show you how that works. If I, here I am on some Bing query. I ran that search string. It doesn't have to have special commands in it, just any query. So what you want to do is go to that web address at the top. And then at the end of that URL, just add ampersand format equals RSS. Now, it may look like a weird page after you do that, but don't worry about it. You want to copy the web address that just got generated by adding that new thing at the end. So you can right mouse click, select copy, and here's the fun part. So now we go to Outlook, and other email clients support this as well. What you want to do is click on your RSS feeds folder. So everyone has this, but you may not have realized it's there. It's right under the Outbox option. And what you want to do is right mouse click on that and select R, uh, add a new RSS feed. And this is where you paste that web address that you just generated for your search query. 
and click the Add button. And it has an option for you to rename it if you want to. You don't really have to. So it says Add your feed to Outlook. You do. And in come the results. And it will continue to send you new results that match your search criteria as they are indexed by the search engine. So what I love about this is if I'm doing a search, I come up with a great search string, it gets me some results, and now inevitably I'm called off to do some other kind of sourcing. What happens to this search? I still want to see these kinds of candidates, but I don't have time to run the search string. Well, this is doing it for me. So new results come in. When I have time, I go to that folder. I take a look at what new things have come in. I can click the links to go to those results. And also, because I am it's effectively the same as an email coming into Outlook. I can even use Outlook's rules to auto-forward this content. So if I decide that there's some other researcher on my team who wants to pursue these leads, I can just set a rule that says anytime new results come in for this uh, search alert, just automatically forward it to that colleague, and then they'll get those leads to process instead. So definitely take advantage of that free function uh, within Outlook and other clients. So let's talk here about uh, what some people call a honeypot. It's basically a lead generator, kind of a magnet that you would put online. You've seen this, I'm sure, with various marketers out there who will say, you know, fill out this short web form and you'll get a link to our webinar or our white paper on whatever. I highly encourage recruiters to do the same thing because you're doing something that's very analogous to what those marketers are doing to generate sales leads. You're trying to recruit passive talent leads. And so if you can put out a similar link that's going to get uh, those kinds of people attracted to it, then that's very useful. And I would actually ask some of you right now, we're going to do this in real time for those of you who are live on the webinar, go to this web address, j.mp at that's a demo. That's, that's a demo. That web address is going to take you to a Google form, which is completely free for you to create if you want to do something analogous. And that's the nice thing about just about everything I'm showing you today is free. So you've got no budgetary issues in replicating what I'm trying to, to show you here. And that little form, which asks you just a few questions, the kind of stuff that you would probably be asked for any other kind of web form that was going to in turn give you something of value. I can then take all of those leads and send out a customized communication to each person. So you'll see how this uh, works in just a second. So I'm going to take a look and see what content uh, has been added to that form. And to get to that, uh, you're just going to go to Google Drive. So if you have any kind of Google account, Gmail, YouTube, whatever, you also have Google Drive. You may not realize it. That's drive.google.com. And you can create uh, web forms here. So that form that I just uh, shared with you looks just like this. It's real easy to add questions, change questions. My version looks slightly different from the one you're seeing because I can edit these fields, change the questions, and, and so on. But what happens is it comes up with data. So let's see what has been populated. Very good. We've got a bunch of names here. So these leads I'm now going to download. So I'm going to select this Download As from the File menu, Microsoft Excel. And that goes right to my Downloads folder, unless you've specified a different one for where you put your content. And so what I'll do with those leads that have been generated by my Honeypot is I'll send them some kind of message. And this would be very similar to the type of candidate communication that you would send normally. But you want to leverage those merge fields to make it seem a little more personalized. And these are good tips that I got from Amy Beth Quinn, by the way, who many of you may know a long-time sourcer with the Sourcing 7 in Seattle. So in my letter here that I've generated, I'm going to use the Mailings tab. And this is all using Microsoft Office combined with that free Google form. So those of you who have the Microsoft Office suite, 
You don't have to buy anything extra to, to do this. It's not that you can't use CRM programs. If you have those kinds of things that do email campaigns, that's great. But if you don't have a tool like that, this works almost as well. And all I have to do is say, I'm going to start a merge of email messages. And then I just have to tell it where my list of names is. I'm going to use an existing list. And we save that to the downloads folder. And there's the latest file. And I'm going to select that. And now I can start populating things. So I know I want to have a salutation that has their first name. So where here, where I would normally put a first name, I'm going to insert a merge field, which is the top choice at the top. And that's where I pick first name, which was part of that form that I generated. And I also asked what town you lived in. So I'm working that into the text of my template as well. And I'll select town. And again, you can have all kinds of other fields in your letter. This is not a very well-crafted one, but you should definitely spend time doing that. And then you can click preview to see how it looks. So I go through the results just to make sure it looks good. Some people did not populate their um, city, so that's why a couple of them have that missing. If that's the case, you can actually use rules in Word to say, when you have a field that's blank, substitute something else instead. So I won't show you that feature, but you can find that under the uh, Help menu in Word when you're doing mail merges. And the other thing I might have done also is because some people input their name with lowercase letters. They weren't too concerned. In the Excel file, might have reformatted that using the proper function to uh, make it all proper uh, name case. But once you have all that set, then you just go under Finish and Merge, select Send Email Messages. You have to tell it where the to field is, where you have the email addresses, but that is from that same Google form. And then I put in the subject line. And of course, the subject line is not a throwaway. This is probably the single most important thing of any communication you send out. You want it to be engaging. You want it to be relevant. Um, it often should have a call to action. There's a whole school of thought about how you should do this kind of thing. Uh, I like using questions. Uh, also, the time of year matters. So this is a great time, for example, to say something like, what's your career New Year's resolution? Because people are starting to think about what their job should be for 2015. So that would be a, an interesting subject line to try. And then, of course, that would influence the content of the body of the message. So you can have that kind of subject line. What's your career New Year's resolution for 2015? And if I click Send, it's actually going to send out these messages in real time, because this is integrated with Outlook. So. If I go to my uh, outbox here, you'll see that messages are actually being sent to all these people that are in that file. So many of you are probably getting a message right now with that. So very easy way to send out a campaign. And I'm going to. Uh, Stop that at that point, but you get the idea. Let's talk for a second about Chrome extensions. Everyone has their favorite browser, but if you have not migrated yet, or at least made Chrome a secondary browser uh, for your computer, I highly recommend it. There was a time when Firefox had the most of these special uh, add-ons, as they call them, that enhance your browser, giving you extra functionality. But uh, I'd say in the last year, Chrome uh, has really done a good job with its uh, web store of different little add-on apps. Uh, they call them extensions that you can put into your browser that lets you do extra things. And people are creating all kinds of neat things. So I've got a list of a bunch of these that I would highly recommend you download. They are all free, or at least a free trial for a few of them. Uh, and you can see how they work. I'm just going to illustrate a couple that I think are very useful. So when I'm on 
a social network. So let's say, um, let's pull up somebody here. So I'm looking at someone's profile. And what you'll notice is that I have all of these little icons along the top right of my Chrome browser. These are different extensions that I've installed. And they're automatically detecting things based on the page that I'm on. If I'm viewing someone's social network page, it can be LinkedIn, it often works pretty well with Facebook pages, Twitter pages, and some others. Um, I can click things like this one called here, 360 Social, and you can see that it's automatically detecting, uh, in this case, uh, seven different social networks that she has, which of course is going to give me the means to find other ways to contact her. And this is not uh, just because she's a first degree person. I could have picked somebody who was not a first degree contact and often finds just as much data. Let me pull up somebody that might be uh, a little more remote. So a second degree, a third degree. Here's someone who's a second degree. So again, it will automatically detect what it can about that person. Uh, here along the top, you'll see there's an extension called Profit, which is going to make a guess at his work email address. Sometimes it even finds home email address. So uh, that's a useful tool to save me some time. Some social networks may be discovered. Here's that 360 thing, didn't find anything. There are some others uh, that sometimes find other data. I can't tell you that any single one of them is going to find everything. These are free after all, but um, cumulatively uh, they can be very useful and save you some time. Extensity is a good one. I would highly recommend that. And the idea there is if you have a lot of these extensions, sometimes when they have similar functionality, they overlap each other. Sometimes they even conflict. Um, it's a little better than it used to be. Like you can typically click a little X at the top to close these things, or they have a slider to expand or contract them. So if, however, you can't see the thing you're looking for, what the Extensity Chrome extension does is it shows you a master list of all of the extensions you have loaded in Chrome, and you can instantly uh, close or open it simply by clicking on the name of it. It will activate it or deactivate it, which is uh, very handy. All right. Many more tools in this category. You'll see a bunch of them again when you get the deck. All these hyperlinks will take you right to those pages and you can check them out. But in the interest of time, I think I'm going to move to a different topic, which is the kind of the mirror image of what we just showed. So instead of trying to find information about people pulling their info in, how do we push stuff out? We have things we want to share, not just job postings, but the thing I really encourage people to do is to share the subject matter expertise of their employer. Your company has a lot of knowledge in its people, and that is the thing that's going to appeal to a lot of the candidates you're trying to attract. They want to know that they're going to be working with a bunch of other subject matter experts that they can learn from and enjoy working with. So putting out that kind of content I think is a great idea, and this will show you how to do it. I'm going to take you through a couple of my favorite tools. One is called the Hootlet, which comes from Hootsuite. So let's say that I'm on a page that has some of my uh, company's good content. And if you're not sure where that is, I would just do a search on a search engine for blog and your company name, and you'll probably even find uh, your company's official blogs that have that kind of useful content. And you can certainly ask around. Your marketing department probably has sources of other content. It just needs to be something useful. So let's say that I found an interesting post that I wanted to share. When I'm on the page of whatever it is that I want to share with someone else, it almost doesn't matter uh, what page it is. As long as you're on the page you want to share, that's when I click this little hooplet. It's a little, uh, looks like an owl, the bird. And when I click that, it automatically pulls in the web address and title of the page, but it's still giving me a chance to customize this. So you can see I can put, for example, learn how to in front of the headline. The hyperlink 
So that article is automatically shortened, which helps with tracking. And here's the fun part. I can select which social networks I want to share this with of mine. You can put in your LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Facebook. It supports a few others. Uh, you can even select all of them if you wanted. And then here's uh, this is this is fun too. You can if if you come up with this content at a time, say in the middle of the night, that's not necessarily when you want to share it because most people are not looking at uh, tweets and such at that time. So you can auto schedule it for a future time and have it post out to your social networks later. And you can schedule whenever you want that to go. Or if you click the send now button instead, it'll just post it right uh, live at that time to all those social networks as an update. So how about taking it to the next level? Instead of these ad hoc posts whenever you come across something interesting, what if you have a feed of content that you want to share? So let's say and this is a good example too. So if your company has a feed of content that it's putting out at a not too uh, rapid uh, basis, so let's say here's what you want to look for, is every uh, blog feed or any feed will have that orange and white creamsicle style icon. That's the RSS feed icon. That web address is what you want. So you want to copy the web address that's related to the feed. And all you have to do is right mouse click that link and say copy that link address. And now we're going to use a different tool called Deliver It, which is the word deliver without the vowels, .it. So get yourself a free account on that site. And then what you're going to do there, same process of, that you would do on the Hootsuite Hootlet tools, you'll add links to your social networks and then put in the feed that you want to share. So I want to add these posts that come from my company's blog. So I click under sources. I want to add an RSS feed source. And I would be connecting a new feed. Uh, if you've already added it, it would be listed. But no, you're going to be doing a new feed. I paste that web address that goes with the RSS feed. And I'm going to tell it how often I want to share stuff. So you don't want to overwhelm people. So maybe I'll do an update once a day. You can change the menu to that. Um, you can say I only want to post one new thing at a time. And maybe I only want to do one for the whole day, two for the whole day, whatever you're comfortable with. And it even lets you do further customization in terms of what it puts in front of it. So you save that information. And then what's going to happen is every time a new post comes out by that source, it's going to automatically be shared as an update on your LinkedIn, Facebook, or whatever other social networks you list here under destinations. It's an amazing tool for free. And if everyone at your company was doing the same thing, you'd be able to share a lot of content. It drives a lot of traffic to their social network profiles and probably will get you a lot of employee referrals as well. All right, so let's look at a different category, which is X-raying. Everyone knows about the idea of searching deep within one particular site, but I don't know if people really take this to the level that they should, which is you really need to identify different virtual communities out there that are relevant to the kinds of candidates that you're looking for. So if you're looking for user experience designers, for example, then do the kind of query that's going to find you those kinds of sites. And then you can do uh, the syntax, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is S-I-T-E colon followed by the name of the site. And then whatever other keywords indicate that someone has a uh, individual profile. So in the case of Stack Overflow, which is a very popular technical community, if you look for the word users in the URL um, and to even narrow it further, put user in the title of the page and then follow it with some technical term or some or maybe a location term that you can see here. That's going to allow you to really narrow the results to the kinds of people that you're looking for. And you can go individually through each of those results if you really wanted to, but I'm here to try to save you some time. So instead of 
looking through each individual result, wouldn't it be nice if there was a way to automatically grab all of the profiles or other people information that's linked from each of these search results? Well, the good news is you can do that with what's called a web scraper. So web scraping is something that's been around for a long time, but I'd say only in the last couple of years have I seen recruiters really embrace it as a way to automate the acquisition of people data. And a lot of the software tools out there that you're probably buying licenses for are doing this on the back end. So you can do it yourself, though. There's a free tool called Outwit Docs if you want to get their full-fledged version that uh, really lets you do unlimited amounts of scraping. Uh, that costs about 75 bucks, to, and that's a permanent license, by the way, not even an annual license. Uh, it's a really good deal to get that. So you launch this tool, which uh, you can, just like any other app, you can see it looks a lot like a web browser, and you can even type Google queries uh, in the box here at the top. So here I have um, a query that I run. It's showing me Google results. And each of these are linking to something about people. So this is a resume type of search, but you could do it with any kind of query that you want. And so what I'm going to do in this case, since I'm linking to document results of resumes, they could be PDFs, they could be Word docs, um, I'm going to click the documents link in the left column menu, and it's automatically detecting which of those results uh, links to a document of some kind. And then all I have to do is right mouse click on that group, say uh, select all, and I will then select download selected files. And you can even specify where you want to download them to. So maybe I'll put them to my downloads folder. I can create a new folder here. Just so I have an easy place to uh, find them quickly. And now this will go through in real time, going to each of those individual pages, grabbing the linked document, and then saving it to my computer. It doesn't take that long. I'd say probably about uh, five seconds per page, maybe less, depending on how fast your internet connection is. And then if I go to that folder on my machine, this is called webinar. There are all those resumes. So that's really nifty, great way to automatically scrape, as they call it, data off the internet much more efficiently than you could do it going page by page yourself. So if you want to learn more about how to do scraping for different kinds of sites, because every type of search might be a little bit different, I've got a nice how-to video link here that will help you with that. And you probably have colleagues who have done some web scraping. Ask around, and they can help you with it as well. So the last topic I want to touch on today uh, is called bookmarklets. And you may be familiar with the, the idea of a bookmark, which is just a link to a page. But a bookmarklet is taking it to the next level, because it's not just bringing you to a search result. It's actually doing something. And there's a lot of ways you can use it. Uh, it could look up uh, things on a search engine for you. Um, it could highlight results. Um, it can run all kinds of searches. It's really there's a wide range of things that, that it's capable of doing. And that's because there's JavaScript built into it. Now, you don't have to know JavaScript in order to leverage bookmarklets, because many of these bookmarklets are already available online. And you can simply drag them right into your browser, and you'll have them. And I've got a few different ways that you can uh, add bookmarklets to your browser. My favorite type uh, is number three, so I'm going to skip to that one, called the Bookmarklet Combiner. And my thanks to Aaron Lintz, a very sharp sourcer out there, who uh, showed me this tool originally a long time ago. And I use it quite regularly. So I'm going to skip to that one, just so you can see how cool it is. So. I have a starter set of bookmarklets. You'll get the link to this. Again, this is on slide 27. So it goes to this page. So what are you going to do with this page? Well, you scroll to the very bottom, 
and you'll see it's got this button under result called, and this guy call it, that's a bookmark. Let's just drag that little thing, that button, to your bookmarks bar. So you can put it right on the top bar. You can put it within a folder on your bookmarks bar. But once it's there, frankly, you don't even need this page anymore. Forget that it's even there. All you need to worry about is that you've got this thing in your bar. And here's how we use it. If I click it, you'll notice that it launches a whole bunch of different special choices here along the left-hand column. And these are for different kinds of functionality. So I can't show you all of them, but I'll just show you one way that I like to use my favorite of, of that whole group that I think is very useful. So I launch a new tab and click this. And there's one I have at the top called Enter Person Name and State. So in other words, if I'm trying to find information about a person, so I'll put myself in just, but you could copy or paste a name. And then you put in the two-letter state abbreviation for where they live. This also works, by the way, for Canadian provinces. So I live in Massachusetts. Watch what happens. I don't know if you caught that, but it launched six different tabs simultaneously where it's looking for that name and state combination on a whole bunch of websites all at once. So it looked for people named Glenn Guttmacher who live in Massachusetts. So the bookmark has the logic built in to know that MA corresponds to Massachusetts. I click the People tab. Boom, you found me there. What if you didn't find me there? Well, it also looked for me on Pipple.com, which is a great social site. Oh, there I am there. You could have found more information about me that way. What about searching for me on Zava Search, which is a great online phone directory? Yep, you got my home phone and physical address there. Didn't find me on 411 Info using my whole name, but it did find me using my first initial. And again, the bookmark is smart enough that it will also test using your first initial. And last but not least, it's got another search on PeopleSmart.com, which I find is very good. Not for showing a lot of info because it actually hides stuff with asterisks, but I do like how it shows you what it thinks is your current address, and I find that it tends to get that right. So this way is another way to validate the result that you have the correct town. So you'll have a whole bunch of these special automated bookmarklets available when you get the deck. So I'm going to pause there and see what kinds of questions we have, and thanks for listening. Uh, <clears throat> great, thank you, Glenn. That was um, some awesome information there. Uh, so I, I guess we'll start in with this question. Um, you had talked earlier about uh, you know building a social following to generate referrals, uh, as well as being able to you know export networks. Um, the question: What what is the primary value to a recruiter of having a, a lot of connections uh, or followers or a, a social imprint? Like how well, do you that? Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of arguments for and against a large network, but I'll be very practical about it. I was mentioning how when I'm doing those Facebook graph searches, it's only showing me people who are first and second degree contacts. So the larger the network I have on Facebook, the more results I get when I do that kind of search. And the same thing is true on LinkedIn. You're seeing first, second, third degree, and people in your groups. So why wouldn't you join? the maximum 50 groups that LinkedIn allows and maximize the size of your network just so you're able to see more names when you search. So that's a whole separate argument for why to have a large network beyond you know, how you're interacting with that network, which is a separate question and worthy of the discussion. But I'm focusing just on the sourcing reasons for doing it. OK, great. Um, we had a question in terms of you had done some examples of both uh, you know mail merge uh, as well as RSS feeds into uh, Outlook, and the question was, does that work with Gmail, and if so, how? Yeah, so Gmail is a little bit different. Uh, there were some links that you'll see uh, when you get to that slide. I have to back up to uh, find that one, but the. Um, there are equivalent tools for mail merge uh, within Gmail that are pretty good. I have not used them uh, as much because I, I still I think it's just so easy to do it with Outlook. But if you don't have it, uh, take a look at those tools 
that I have on that slide. I think it'll be uh, slide 12 when you get it. You'll see uh, a few links from that first bullet. Okay, great. Um, and then just in terms of the bookmarklets uh, as well as some of the uh, profile aggregation tools that you showed, um, I got a question that, you know, in, in many countries in, in Europe and around the world uh, that you're recruiting for, that could be a violation of, of privacy information. Do you have any tools that you could recommend specifically for uh, sourcing in Europe? Yeah, so I think if it is a tool that was created within a region or a country, they're probably more sensitive to the data privacy rules in that area, and so you're probably safer using them. So, for example, Zing, which is spelled X-I-N-G dot com, they, you know, originated in Germany. That most of their uh, users are in uh, Western and Central Europe. They're probably going to be a safer site to work with. Uh, in other regions, I can't say I recommend any one in particular, but um, if your concern is what's legal and not, I would be sticking with vendors that are based in that location. Okay, great. Um, you had earlier talked about sharing, you know, good relevant content with, with you know, your social networks. Uh, do you find any specific content that, that works better uh, than others or better times of day to post uh, to reach candidates? Yeah, so you'll see on one of the slides, I didn't call it out, but I think people typically respond better to stuff sent uh, mid-morning local time and also mid-afternoon can work well. So I would try to time your messaging for those slots and day of the week can also matter. Uh, Friday doesn't seem to be as good as some other days of the week. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, probably better choices. As far as the nature of the content, I think you really need to think in terms of what adds value to your target talent audience. So they're not really interested in seeing a whole bunch of job postings, but is it something that can help them do a better job in whatever their work is right now? So even if they never left their job, what could you add to their day that would make them more productive? That's the kind of content I would be sharing, and that will ensure that not only they stay subscribed to your feeds, but they're going to pass it along to their colleagues. And then finally, when the trigger date is right, you're going to be top of mind and they're going to apply to you first. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, most people have paid LinkedIn access, uh, but a lot of the tools that you showed obviously offer some bypasses to that. Do you think that getting uh, paid access to LinkedIn is worth uh, the investment? Oh boy, yeah, that's always a fun question. So if you want to have the ability to reach out to people without having to research their contact info, then of course emails are very convenient. The problem with that is a lot of recruiters get lazy and they don't do a good job crafting the communication that they send out. So even uh, though they're, it's easy to reach the person, they don't read your message because it's just, it looks too much like a form letter. So I, I really would rather see people spend the time in creating more personalized communication, finding their proper contact info, or sending it out through the social network that the user uses most. So for some people, LinkedIn is their place that they spend their most social time online, in which case, yes, I would reach out to them through InMail. But if you find that the person's presence on Twitter is greater or on Facebook, then that's the channel where I would be messaging the person. Okay, great. Thank you. And, um, you know, in the few minutes that we have left, there a few questions on this. Uh, people were hoping that you could go back through the scraping examples again. Oh, man. So, yeah, it, it, it takes a little time because, remember, I'm having to somewhat customize what that scraper looks like based on the site because it's grabbing data based on how it's formatted on the target website. So if you're like looking for all the lawyers who work at a law firm, I need to see how the data is structured on that law firm's website in order to scrape all those people and their contact info that's there. Uh, the video tutorial that I linked to, I think will do a much better job taking you through those steps. And certainly, do a search online. There's a whole bunch of forums 
and people discussing tools like Outwit and how to scrape with them, you'll find a lot of people now understand how to do that and can give you tips. Okay, great. Um, a couple more last-minute questions came in the couple minutes we have left. Um, a question from Richard, how do you prioritize your methods of sourcing when you are working on quick turnover projects? That's a good one, too. Yeah. So the key is to get critical mass of leads, right? Because you don't need every single person in a space in order to hire. If you know that your ratio of sourced leads to hire is, you know, 80 to 1 or whatever it is, then you know you're going to have to have 80 people in the funnel on the front end in order to eventually, after all the stages in the recruiting process, get that one higher in the end. So whatever it takes to get 80 leads is what you need. And if that can come out of your own applicant tracking system, because you've got a whole bunch of people that haven't been touched in two years who were qualified at one point, but for whatever reason have been ignored since then, well, heck, I'd be going after that pool first. That's easy. And the same thing would probably be true with the LinkedIn search. Those are easier names to find in a targeted way. So whatever gets you to those 80 names fastest is what I would do. The more exotic kinds of searches are what you do when those pools don't yield enough leads to get the higher. So pick the simplest uh, things first. Okay, great. And with that um, concludes today's webinar. Uh, I'd really like to thank you, Glenn. That was awesome and uh, some great tips and tricks there. Um, so in just like to remind everyone who's listening, uh, very shortly we'll be sending you an email uh, with copies of the slides uh, which have interactive uh, links obviously, as well as a offer to sign up for Recruitify. And again, your first submitted and accepted candidate on there, uh, we're hooking you up with 100 bucks. So uh, pretty easy way to make some cash. Uh, so with that, again, thank you, Glenn, and thank you to our sponsors, Recruitify. And as a reminder, a uh, recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees within 48 hours. Thanks so much for listening. We appreciate your time.